This is the new and improved Polestar 2, and while not much has changed on the outside, save for this lovely smart panel across the front, major changes have been made under the skin, including the one key change that I most wanted to see as a Polestar owner myself. Jack, now, Jack, uh, Jack, are you sure that's the new Polestar 2? What do you mean? Is that the new Polestar 2? Yeah. Are you sure that's not the new Polestar 2? Just taped a bit of cardboard to the front of it, because you're jealous. The Fully Charged Show is generating positive energy with its live events all around the world. Next up, it's Fully Charged Live Canada. Click the top right of the screen to get your tickets today. After three years of production and over 100,000 units sold, Polestar has decided it's time to do a little bit of refreshing to its first and to date only production car. And as a Polestar 2 owner and let's be honest, self-confessed Polestar fanboy, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they've improved on this already fantastic car. And more to the point, really looking forward to seeing whether they've addressed some of the gripes that I have with my own Polestar 2 from 10,000 miles of driving. There are three of them. Number one, no bespoke architecture. This car, of course, sits on what is essentially a petrol-powered Volvo platform. Inevitably, that impairs things like cabin space. It's not bad in here, it's pretty roomy. I've got lots of headroom, but this gigantic gear tunnel is a bit irritating. I could do with a little bit more room for my left knee. And that ice architecture is also to blame for the fact that this car has the turning circle of a medium-sized yacht. Number two, not especially exciting to drive. This is a very, very capable car. It's really easy to move it down a twisty road very quickly, but doing so isn't what you'd call thrilling, especially compared to something like the BMW i4, which is much more enjoyable to drive, and in my opinion, one of this car's most direct rivals. And number three, efficiency. A real, real weak point of the Polestar 2. I think over 10,000 miles, I've averaged something like 3.3 miles to the kilowatt hour, which is distinctly average. It's right down the bottom end of what we expect from brand new electric cars. And as a result, Polestar is having to lump their vehicles with fairly large batteries just to get half decent range out of them. And that's just not really on brand for a company that gives it large about sustainability. But here's the good news. Of those three gripes of mine, two have been directly addressed with this facelift. The car still sits on ice car Volvo architecture. That's a given. You can't really replace that. That wouldn't be a facelift. That would be a new car. As a result, it is still quite snug down here for Mini. But there is a new motor in this car, which is substantially more efficient than the outgoing version, meaning the car is more efficient and rangier. And here's the best part, and this is the thing I am the most excited about today. That motor is now mounted in the back. That's right, this single motor variant of the Polestar 2 is now rear wheel drive. Now, of course, the question is, does this newly rear-wheel drive Polestar 2 feel substantially more rewarding to hurry down a lovely, twisty, English bumpy road? Well, let's find out. Let's go one pedal driving off so that we're using our brake pedal. Let's firm up the steering. Let's, let's turn off traction control. Why not? Even there, just pulling away, there is definitely a distinct sense of being pushed from behind instead of pulled along by those front wheels, which is just, for some reason that I can't properly explain, so much more rewarding if you're a driving nerd. This is definitely a more enjoyable car to drive now than it was before. Worth noting also that that fancy new motor mounted in the rear isn't just more efficient, it's more powerful. This is now faster as well, so you can really enjoy that chassis a little bit more. Because this is a big, heavy, grippy car, I wasn't entirely sure just how noticeable the difference would feel going to rear wheel drive, but it's there. The front wheels feel just so much less encumbered now that all they have to worry about is steering the car. Oh, it's better. And frankly, this chassis just deserves rear wheel drive because it is so capable that it was 
wasted on a front wheel drive setup. We know from our time out on the ice lakes of northern Sweden with Polestar's chassis whisperer Joachim Ridholm, just how talented and balanced this chassis is. It should always have been rear wheel drive and it is so much better for it. Right, we briefly interrupt this review for a new segment I like to call Jack's Polestar Easter Eggs, which is code for things I didn't know my own car could do until members of the Polestar PR team explained them to me because I'm a dum-dum. Polestar owners, this one's few, and I want you to comment below and tell me how many of these did you know about? Be honest. Number one, long press of the unlock button. All four windows come down. Long press of the lock button, they all go back up. Nice little touch. My Golf used to do that. So that makes me happy. Number two is regarding the sensor underneath the back of the car for opening the boot. Now, that's no secret. You know that there is one, but the technique, people think you've got to be super accurate. They think you've got to do, what's this? Stop doing that. Anywhere underneath the back of the Polestar, just a kick. That's all it takes. Dead easy. People overthink it. Inside, next up, we've got the curry hook. This is a Volvo staple. This has been on Volvos forever and ever. You've got a lovely hot takeaway, but you don't want to put it in the footwell because the first time you apply the brakes, your chips are going to go everywhere. So you use the curry hook. Look at that. Instead of hot food in your footwell, you can have it swinging around like a pendulum filled with curry. Much better. Number four, we're into the really good stuff now. This one came through a recent update and it's a bit of a game changer. Currently my projected range in my gauge cluster is based off of the WLTP number. It's a fairly useless number, but if I change it to projected, now it's showing a projected number based off my recent driving habits. Much more accurate, much more useful, also a bit scary because, well, it goes from 230 miles to 130 miles, which tells you a little bit about how I've been driving today. And then the final one, and this one really did blow my mind. I love this. This material in the middle of the car, very fingerprinty. It, it's, it's awfully fingerprinty. And I complained to Polestar and they said, well, why are you touching it? I said, because the park button's there. They said, why are you pressing the park button? You don't have to ever press the park button in your Polestar 2. You drive away, you get to where you're going, you stop, you open the door. The car goes into park automatically. I think the thing that's really impressive about these facelifted Polestar 2s is that despite being faster, more powerful, better to drive, they are also more efficient and rangier. The standard range version of the P2 is going to have the exact same battery as the pre-facelift cars, but thanks to the new motors and a slightly different battery chemistry, it's got an extra 25 miles of WLTP range. That's purely through improved efficiency. You love to see it. Meanwhile, for the long range versions of the facelifted Polestar 2, they've combined those more efficient motors with a slightly bigger battery, about four or five kilowatt hours bigger, but also on the dual motor cars, the ability to decouple the front motor when it's not needed to even further improve efficiency. When you're wafting along on the motorway, front motor decouples, you've got yourself a rear wheel drive, more efficient car. When you start sending it along a twisty B road, you get your front motor back for an extra grip and power and when you combine all of that, the result is that the long-range dual motor version of the Polestar 2, which again has gained 80 newton meters of torque amid this refresh, has also gained 65 extra miles of WLTP range. That is like having your cake and eating it, and then also someone gives you another cake. And then you add to all the major improvements made with this facelift, all the stuff that was already great about the Polestar 2, like the design, which I think is fantastic. It hasn't aged a day. It's even further improved by that smart panel at the front, which is a subtle thing, but I think it really speaks to Polestar fully embracing EV design. There's no need for a faux grill. It doesn't need to breathe. It needs to see, so it has a smart panel. Like this interior, which is exquisite, which is minimalist without feeling threadbare and finished in beautiful materials and just amounts to a lovely, desirable object. Like this Google interface, which just works. It's been incrementally improving via over-the-air updates, but it was great to begin with. And one of the highest compliments that I can pay this car is that it's one of only two car brands where I don't even bother connecting my phone because the software 
works. Polestars and Teslas, everything else, give me Apple CarPlay. And then there's the big overarching thing I really admire about Polestar, which is their commitment to sustainability and their transparency around their carbon emissions, which by the way, have come down three tons per car since they started building Polestar 2s, which is to say this one I'm sat in, its manufacturer created three tons less CO2 than the first Polestar 2s to roll off the production line. That is staggeringly impressive. Some of the recent changes that Polestar have made to bring that number down even lower include going fully green as far as the energy that powers their factory and switching wheel manufacturer to one that does the same. I just don't see any other car brands showing this same proactive uh, dedication to bringing that number down as quickly as possible. And of course, this is all part of Polestar's Polestar Zero mission to be building carbon neutral cars by 2030. People who can afford nice things are always going to want nice, luxurious things. That's never gonna change. It's idealistic to suggest that everyone's gonna be driving around in hyper-efficient, super frugal micro cars in the future. It's not gonna happen. Polestar acknowledges that and their thinking is, well, if people are gonna still want nice, big luxury things, let's build them so greenly that there's no guilt involved. I think that's pretty cool. So there we go then, the new and improved Polestar 2. Now more efficient, rangier, faster, more fun, and more sustainable than ever. To choose a Model 3 over one of these, you'd have to hate yourself.